what I thought I would talk about um, today is to put um, the career of, of one surgeon, one general surgeon, one surgical oncologist in perspective for you and uh, give you a little bit of a history of how maybe how the profession developed and, um, and how I experienced it um, uh, in, um, in my training. So these are the themes of a career then that, that I'll touch on as we work through and hopefully it will be a little bit interesting to you and maybe helpful. I had a conviction early on that we could do better in providing surgical care for cancer patients. I had a belief um, that grew during my training here at Stanford that the approaches and techniques that I learned in my um, specialty training in areas outside of general surgery could be applied to the benefit of cancer patients. I had a real desire to build, uh, to, to help build multidisciplinary programs that would allow us to provide the best possible care for more patients with cancer. Um, and I had an interest in contributing to both bench and population-based research based on some very early experiences that I had that I'll share with you. When it came um, to my choice to um, train here in surgery at Stanford, these were some of the things that were important to me. Uh, there was the availability of outstanding clinical training a very, across a very diverse patient population, not just here at a tertiary care medical center, but also mm -hmm. at Valley Medical Center, Safety Net Hospital, at the VA, at Kaiser, for example. There were a limited number of clinical fellows who were competing for cases. Uh, there was ex an excellent cadre of trainees around me who would be joining me in the training program I knew from the people that I had worked with. There was flexibility to integrate research time. I wasn't sure that I'd be able to do research as a resident because of a health service scholarship that I had. And I, I wanted the opportunity to do that, but I wasn't sure I was going to be able to. I knew there was access to good mentorship and sponsorship from being a medical student here. <clears throat> there was a rectangular, not pyramidal structure at the time. There were still some pyramidal residency programs. That's how old I am. Um, and it was, the program had a reputation I thought deserved for being a non-malignant program, and that was important to me. It was a relatively humane on-call uh, requirement uh, schedule. Um, this was, of course, before um, work hour restrictions. And there was a demonstrated commitment, a proven commitment, that was led by the chair at the time, John Collins, to diversity in the training program, including the recruitment of women early uh, into a surgical residency program in a time when that wasn't nearly as common as it is today. So those were all things that were important to me. Um, and they, I think they probably still uh, ring true today. So I came to Stanford, as Electron mentioned, um, in August of 1980. Everything that I owned I had put into a 1972 Plymouth Duster, had been my dad's car, and I drove across the country um, I had never been west of the Rocky Mountains. I had interviewed for Stanford uh, in New York because I could not afford to come out here to, um, to visit uh, for, for the medical school interview. And I, I based my decision on the pamphlet that I got in, in the mail, um, especially in the people that I met during the interview. Uh, but I was fortunate to get a scholarship and I arrived here. I was already interested in cancer research when I got to this campus. I had done some population-based research, some epidemiology. When I was a sophomore at Dartmouth, I had done an internship in environmental protection in New Jersey, and I somehow convinced them, this is before we had data transfer agreements, well before that, to give me all of their data, the state's data on cancer incidence rates by zip code, uh, along with, in, with data on air and water quality. I went back to Dartmouth. I wrote a computer program in BASIC. I did the statistical analyses. And my mentor on that project was this guy, Gordon McDonald, a geophysicist. He was out of his element. I was out of my element, but just a tremendously um, uh, inspirational uh, teacher um, at the time. This is Gordon in 1979. He's on the steps of the US Capitol. He's got his hand above his head. He's telling people that's where the water level will be after climate change. 1979, amazing. I also worked with Karen Wetterhahn, um, a gifted investigator and a real advocate for women in science uh, when I was an undergrad. Uh, 
I got my, I uh, published my first paper based on work that I had done in Karen's lab. Uh, we demonstrated this was a transformative research experience for me that this, um, that this uh, carcinogen, this very potent carcinogen called nickel subsulfide, which everybody thought was tremendously insoluble, so how could it cause cancer, was actually very soluble in biologic media and would bind to both DNA and protein. That's a picture of a test tube with nickel subsulfide after it goes into solution. It turns into this gorgeous uh, aquamarine blue color. Uh, and uh, seeing that in the lab that first morning after I had set up this experiment for months was uh, absolutely a transformative experience for me. Karen, unfortunately, as uh, some people may know, died in a, a tragic laboratory accident of overwhelming uh, methylmercury uh, poisoning. Uh, really, uh, really, really sad story, but a wonderful person and investigator. When I got here to Stanford, I was interested still in both population-based research and epidemiology to, uh, as well as laboratory bench research. Those are two themes that have played out through my entire career. Uh, I can't decide and I tend to do everything. So, um, uh, you know, that's not advice. That's um, uh, just the way it is. So I worked with Alice Whittemore, Ralph Paffenbarger on some uh, epidemiology uh, research, some cancer epidemiology research, large population-based studies using uh, questionnaire data from Harvard and UPenn, thousands and thousands of patients, really, um, it, really fascinating work um, and great mentors as well. And then I worked in the laboratory as a resident for two years on um, cancer immunology. And I worked with Alan Krensky and Carol Clayberger, two first-class scientists um, who were primarily doing research on um, autoimmune disease in uh, kidney patients and transplant rejection in patients undergoing heart transplants. And when I went to them and said I wanted to study tumor immunology, they said, um, we have a T32. That's really cute, Jeff. We'll let you do that for two years, but you know that <clears throat> immunotherapy will never cure cancer. So I'm not the only one who heard that at the time, but just, you know, kind of a fascinating uh, little piece of history. And um, so uh, Alan Carroll and I and others in the laboratory worked on um, one of the first projects we worked on was a description of how not just alpha beta T cell receptors, but also gamma delta T cell receptors could uh, identify and kill cancer cells. Uh, really, really interesting project. So, those themes of population science and uh, laboratory bench science have played out through my career. I've been very fortunate to be able to have access to uh, tremendous uh, mentorship and sponsorship and collaboration at MD Anderson. These are some of the people's, people that I've worked with, uh, particularly Liz Grimm on the lower right. Liz and I wrote <coughs> the first uh, NCI spore grant in melanoma that was ever funded in the United States um, <coughs> um, probably 15 years ago or so. And just uh, uh, just a great group of people, Chris Amos and John Ravel, also um, uh, uh, geneticists and immunologists, population scientists, epidemiologists. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about science, but I wanted to kind of ground it in the care of the patients that we see today at Anderson and at Stanford. Um, and the, this is uh, these are just a couple of examples. A 50-year-old man who had primary melanoma of the skin developed spread to his armpit lymph nodes. They were removed with surgery. A couple of years later, unfortunately, but predictably, he developed a metastasis to his left adrenal gland. No other sites of disease. He received what at the time was experimental or investigational treatment, now a standard of care, a checkpoint inhibitor, epilumumab, and then vimurafenib, um, a targeted agent because he had a favorable BRAF mutation in his tumor, as half of these patients will. He had a partial response to those treatments. He still had radiographically a tumor in the left adrenal gland. So we think it's very reasonable what we did because we don't have perfect information about um, how these patients will do. We removed it with surgery. He was referred to me, minimally invasive adrenalectomy. We do these at Anderson from the back as a retroperitoneoscopic procedure. We like that approach. No living cancer cells remaining. So how would you predict he would do? You would predict he might do very well. And as a matter of fact, the data would support you in that. He's been cancer-free for more than five years. So that's a success story. We're seeing more of those. 
and the data supports it, uh, that these patients can, can in fact be cured. But um, <clears throat> there's still a lot of work to do. Why my colleagues and I continue to go back to the laboratory, um, why some of you may be interested in careers in, in, in cancer surgery and cancer research is this patient. This is a patient, a young woman who had a left neck melanoma, developed distant metastases in the left upper abdomen, as you can see there, a large and very serious cancer, abdominal pain, some GI bleeding. Uh, she was treated with immune checkpoint inhibitor, a standard approach nowadays, and she um, unfortunately had a very severe toxic response with terrible colitis um, with that first, uh, first injection with uh, the immunotherapy drug. Uh, so she was switched because she had a BRAF mutation to a combination of BRAF neck inhibitors, dual, check, dual targeted agents, another standard approach nowadays. She had a partial response, <clears throat> but unfortunately that partial response was only temporary, again common in patients who receive checkpoint inhibitors. Her tumor regrew, she became symptomatic again and she was referred back to me for consideration for surgery. We did an upper abdominal type of exenerative operation. It went very well. She recovered very well. I've seen her in post-op a few months later. She continues to do well as NED, but you would predict that this patient who did not have complete response in her tumor is at very high risk for recurrence, both locally and distant, so we still have work to do. So these are the things that my lab has been interested in, the genes most important to causing melanoma, the genes that control recurrence of melanoma, how do we identify what, what's responsible for a patient's response to treatment, how can we prevent melanoma in the future, better select patients for treatments and design new treatments. And I've come at this in this part of my career with the assumption that genetics is inherently interesting and potentially very important to understanding how patients with cancer will do. Um, I love genetics, I think, it's, uh, I think it's neat, and this is an example. If you let me digress for just a couple of minutes as to why I think genetics is interesting. So I like beer, I'm like Justice Kavanaugh, probably don't like beer as much as he does, but um, many of you probably too, do too. This is a story of beer versus, of, of ale versus lager. <clears throat> Everybody, I think, knows that uh, ale is the oldest form of beer. It was invented somewhere around 6,000 BC. It's easy to make beer. You just, you know, leave stuff out and the, and the yeast, um, which is, um, uh, which, which uh, operates under warm conditions we call top fermenting, creates this, uh, this alcoholic beverage. Well, uh, lager was not invented until 14 or 1500 AD. It's top fermented, it's cold fermented, and the reason that it works is that the yeast is cold tolerant. It's actually the yeast that's used for lager. This was an invention, of course, of the monks in Bavaria. The yeast that is used is a, is a hybrid of that ale yeast, that warm yeast, and a different kind of yeast that is uh, cold tolerant. The parent yeast for that hybrid, the cold side of that hybrid, is not found in Europe. And for a long time, people did not know where that yeast came from, where the parent yeast came from. Well. Enter genetics, enter genome-wide studies of biology, and this paper was published a few years ago that identifies the parent yeast as native to the Patagonia region in South America. So it's a new world yeast. And around that time was when the discovery of the new world was taking place, at least by Columbus and colleagues, and the, the assumption is that they brought back some spores of this yeast to Europe, which then hybridized with the, with the ale yeast, and you know, the rest is uh, German history. So uh, that's just an example to try to get people interested in genetics. Um, results from the genome-wide and technologies that developed from the, uh, from the Human Genome Project allowed us to do studies like this, and Chris Amos and I got together about 10 years ago, wrote, a, wrote up a, a, a proposal and got some NIH funding to do one of the first genome-wide studies of um, uh, genetic determinants of, um, of melanoma. And the top slide is an example of the data that we generated from that study. Um, on, the, on the bottom, um, on the uh, x-axis are all the human chromosomes, on the y-axis are p-values, so you see spikes where there are loci or genes of interest. Uh, and in this study, we identified a gene that predisposed to the development of melanoma. 
uh, involved, uh, locusts involved in DNA repair and pigmentation. Well, flash forward um, uh, almost a decade now, and we've put together our data from first 10 and now 100 uh, different research groups around the world. We've identified 100 loci, over 100 loci, that are linked to the development of melanoma. Just a tremendous example of what we can do when we work together and collaborate both locally and, uh, and distantly. Um, well, why is this important? Uh, it's important for a few reasons, we think. It's important because ultimately we can use this data, we hope, to improve the way that we predict the risk of individuals to develop cancer in the future, including melanoma. And we prove this is proof of principle. Uh, we're not there yet, but we, we can show that even if we take all of the clinical information that we know about a patient, hair color, eye color, skin color, tanning ability, et cetera, and combine that with, um, uh, if we take that information and then combine it with the genetic data, we can improve our ability to predict whether that individual will develop melanoma. Other people are refining these types of um, analyses and will we'll eventually include other scientific data in, but the goal would be to get down to a small population that we can identify that would be um, candidates for chemo prevention trials, for example, uh, for prevention strategies and intensive screening. We've also, I've also been from the beginning interested not only and not even so much in the genes that cause melanoma, but what are the genes that control whether if I get melanoma, I will do well and be cured, or if I get melanoma, I will more likely to have my melanoma come back and may need extra treatment after surgery, for example. Some of the data comes from lining up the, the analyses that we've done with mutation analyses from TCGA, for example, uh, work that Jeff Gershenwald and our group has done, and we do see genes that are um, mutated in uh, um, many melanoma tumors and also represent genes that we identified in our genome-wide studies. So these are particularly important for us to look at to identify mechanisms to intervene for, um, for future treatments. We also can use emerging data from the Human Genome Project. It's not, a static, um, it's not a static repository of information to refine the data that we originally developed from our study 10 years ago and in collaboration with others now to determine what are the targets, what are, what are those genes actually acting on. And we know that, um, that the genes that we identify are actually um, the double helix is folded and folded and folded again to chromatin and parts of uh, the DNA that are that are close to, that are distant to each other become close as chromatin folds, and this is a way to do that mapping and identify the genes that are acted at over a distance by some of the loci that we identify. Again, integrated with human genome uh, data, and the interesting thing from us from our data uh, work that Chen Ying Fang in my lab uh, published just um, just very recently is the top ten genes we identified are all immune genes, all immune and inflammatory genes. So suggesting that these are very important mechanisms in controlling uh, um, the development and seriousness of melanoma. We can also integrate the genetic data with other clinical data on the patients, and this is an early study we did where we lined up all of that genetic data with melanoma tumor thickness. All of you know that the most important predictor of how a melanoma patient will do is the thickness of the tumor when we measure it under the microscope when we first see them in clinic. Um, this is data that shows that we can identify with our GWAS data um, some loci that lead us to genes that are responsible for that tumor thickness, something that astonishingly, astonishing to me, that we have so little information about even today. Uh, very important in identifying potentially genes that are actionable for future therapies. Well, I mentioned immune and inflammatory genes, and a lot of what we do in the lab these days is focused on identifying some of those mechanisms, some of those mechanisms that get in the way of that young woman, for example, that I showed you with melanoma metastatic to the left upper quadrant from having the best possible clinical outcome because she either has toxicity to the immunotherapy treatment or it doesn't work as well as we hope that it will. And these are some of the, some of the studies that we're focused on right now. We're doing a lot of liquid biopsies. Um, that's kind of sexy right now. We were doing it before it was cool, um, where we, we look to identify um, clues in a patient's uh, blood sample 
that demonstrate what's actually happening in the tumor microenvironment. And you can look at mutations from the tumor that get released into the blood. You can do proteomics, metabolomics. What we've chosen to focus on are some of these immune and inflammatory markers that we think are very important in helping to um, determine how a melanoma patient will do. A lot of this work was pioneered in patients with cardiovascular disease, actually. And there's a, uh, an abundance of data that these uh, that these um, immune and inflammatory mechanisms are important in determining who gets a heart attack, who survives a heart attack, who gets a stroke, who survives a stroke, and so forth. So we've extended some of that work from the cancer space into, from the cardiovascular space into the cancer space. And these are a couple of um, publications that, that we publish showing that these immune and inflammatory markers, CRP and vitamin D, they're kind of yin and yang. CRP, when it's up, it's bad. Vitamin D, when it's down, it's bad, um, are independent predictors of how a melanoma patient will do. Draw the blood, determine CRP, determine vitamin D at the time of diagnosis, follow the patient. You can predict whether their melanoma will come back or whether they'll die of melanoma. So we think that these mechanisms are important enough, clinically important enough, that they're worth studying in the laboratory. We go back to the bench then and investigate them in detail to find out what are the mechanisms and how might we um, interrupt those mechanisms to, for the benefit of the cancer patients. We always look at the genetics first. Occasionally, like in the case of IL-12, we find that there's a very strong degree of genetic control over these, um, over these blood biomarkers. Um, that's an exception, I will tell you, to the rule. Most of the time, there's not as much genetic control, and what that means is the genes aren't as important, probably, as the tumor. It's really the tumor that's driving these processes of inflammation. And we're focused right now in the lab on IL-6. It's upstream to CRP, upstream to vitamin D. In other words, it controls the levels of those agents to a great degree. It's produced by melanoma cells and other cancer cells. It's also produced by white blood cells in response to a cancer. It's profoundly immunosuppressive. And it's also, uh, it also is a generator of this maladaptive or bad inflammation. So we're very focused on, on uh, IL-6. This is recent data from the lab. IL-6, an independent predictor of poor outcome, predicts CRP and vitamin D levels as well. And most importantly, the level of IL-6 uh, that you have before you start treatment on immunotherapy predicts whether you'll respond to the immunotherapy medication. Um, there's data from a group in Japan that we're now trying to replicate that if you treat with an anti-IL-6 antibody, pay, um, uh, mice who have melanoma and are receiving immunotherapy that you can make that immunotherapy more effective. So we're really excited about that as potential uh, therapeutic inroad into uh, treating patients like that young woman. We may be able to reduce toxicity at the same time that we increase efficacy. I'm going to finish the basic science part of what I wanted to um, share with you with this story um, because I think it's particularly exciting. Um, it's collaborative work that we have been doing with Rosa Huang, who is a um, who is a uh, cancer surgeon at MD Anderson, uh, who trained with us and then came on faculty. She's been particularly interested from the um, translational research standpoint in pancreas cancer. Of course, we all know that pancreas cancer is a huge area of opportunity. I was talking to Jeff Norton last night about, about his work, and there are real parallels between what Rose is doing and what Jeff is doing, for example, in, um, in, in his research. But a very difficult cancer that most of us have struggled with, those of us who our senior for, um, in uh, surgical oncology for much of our careers. One of the features of pancreas cancer is that there's extensive desmoplasia. There are all these non-cancer cells that surround the cancer and help to support it in autocrine and paracrine, in, in, in paracrine ways um, that allow the cancer to um, progress, to spread, uh, generate, resi gen help generate resistance to chemotherapy and radiation therapy and so forth. So, um, these, um, <clears throat> these stromal cells are uh, an exciting target that um, many people are focused on right now, trying to identify mechanisms that would lead to new treatments. Unfortunately, some of the early trials that have been done looking to see if we get rid of some of the stroma, would it improve the patient's responsiveness to chemotherapy showed the opposite. Uh, patients who were treated with these uh, stromal inhibitors actually did worse. The tumors progressed. So, we, we know that it's a complicated uh, situation. Um, Rosa has focused on this antigen called DKK3. 
Uh, it's highly expressed in pancreas cancer and some other cancers like triple negative breast cancer. And the autocrine and paracrine effects she's shown are mediated by NF-kappa B. Um, if you deplete DKK3, you do prolong survival in a mouse model and delay the onset of pancreas cancer in this, um, in this pancreas cancer mouse model. Um, my role in this project has been primarily we generated a number of, of antibodies for ROSA through a high throughput uh, screening um, uh, um, project that we had for a number of years. And uh, one of these antibodies inhibits, um, uh, it, which binds to DKK3, inhibits pancreas cancer in vitro. Uh, the same antibody um, inhibits primary pancreas cancer growth and metastasis and improves survival in, in a mouse model. Uh, what we're, um, uh, it also works in a clinically relevant model. You let the pancreas cancer develop for a while and then you give the antibody uh, to the mice. Um, if you deplete DKK3, it induces a tumor immune response and this suggested to us that maybe we ought to combine the antibody with, uh, with immunotherapy, which, uh, which Rosa did. And the fascinating thing is we know that checkpoint inhibitor doesn't usually work in pancreas cancer patients. Immunotherapy doesn't usually work in pancreas cancer patients by itself. Similarly, in this mouse model, checkpoint inhibitor by itself doesn't work. But you combine uh, the DKK3 antibody with the checkpoint inhibitor, all the mouse survive. Almost none of them get pancreas cancer. So very dramatic result and obviously something that we're pursuing for potentially uh, therapeutic purposes. So. Like I said, I, I have trouble doing just one thing. And um, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, my experience training here as a surgical resident and how that played out over the course of my career in you know, my chosen vocation, if you will, of, of treating cancer patients. And um, so I did decide to stay here as a, as a resident. And I was, I was very happy that, um, that, uh, that Stanford felt the same way. And I, I was able to match here. Uh, this is the pamphlet, the mimeograph pamphlet that we all got. Um, I saved mine. Shows you how important it was to me. And this is the Division of General Surgery uh, that um, that existed at the time. And you know, some of these people, of course, uh, have passed away. Of course, Dr. Collins and Dr. Oberhelman. It's a picture of me as the chief resident and operating with with Harry. Um, uh, just you know, a treasured photo I have it in my office. Um, and um, you know, others, others who, are, um, who are here in the audience, John Shirk is here actually uh, today. Hey, John. Um, so, and um, uh, just, a, and, and Dr. Mark also is in this pamphlet. I, I was looking, paging through it before I got here, and you're, you're obviously there as, as well. So, uh, these are the things that I took away from me from uh, Stanford. Many more things, but these are things I thought about when I was putting this talk together. Uh, every detail of clinical care matters. I learned that here. A structured approach to any operation will contribute to improved outcomes to patients. I learned that here, including from the people who are in this audience. Respect the role of clinically relevant science in advancing surgical care. I learned that both from John Collins and from Harry Oberhelman. They had totally different approaches to evaluating the literature, um, but they were both wonderful teachers in their own way, and you know, I took away something from uh, both of their styles. Question the status quo. Have a critical and thoughtful approach to the literature. Um, and this one is totally John Collins. Use accurate and specific language in communicating. Anybody who remembers him, um, and Fred was a Fred Derbus was a was a resident with me, so he remembers how we would typically be corrected on rounds by Dr. Collins because the language that we used wasn't specific enough. I do believe that myself, and I use it in communicating, including not so much with the residents or the fellows, but in in what I write and how I try to present things. So. Another reminder of how old I am. <clears throat> this is a rotator. Um, some of you in the audience remember rotators. Other of you, others of you have never had experience. We used to, as medical students and residents, be responsible for, for putting up the x-rays, the actual films on the board and looking at them. I saw my first CAT scan of a patient with pancreas cancer. I will never forget it. In 1982, I was a medical student on my first surgery rotation here at Stanford in a dark room looking at a rotator like this. While the radiologist described to me, to the surgical team, including Dr. Oberhelman, what we were looking at. And he described these gray blobs, one of which was the pancreas, one of which was the pancreas tumor, one of which was the liver, and there were liver metastases. And that was a revelation to me. 
you could see the future, you know, even back then in these grainy images that were hard to interpret. Um, <clears throat> I'll come back to that. But, you know, so, you know, during my training, this is what was happening. Uh, CT imaging had just been invented in 1972. Uh, the, um, the scientists who invented CT imaging uh, justifiably won the Nobel Prize. CT was just introduced into clinical practice in 1980. Okay, so very, very, very uh, uh, around the time that I was transitioning to, um, to be a medical student. The other big change during my training was adjuvant therapy, adjuvant therapy for cancer. So the NSABP trials, Bernie Fisher, um, all of those historical events that you read about probably in medical school nowadays were happening at the time that I was in training. Bernie Fisher and NSABP, the findings of effective uh, chemotherapy, even after they were confirmed by the Milan group, were not accepted immediately. And it really was not until the 1980s, um, Bernie Fisher's BO4, adjuvant uh, uh, therapy for breast cancer, minimizing surgery for breast cancer, a concept that was not popular with Dr. Collins. Uh, he was really um, a um, modified radical mastectomy guy till the day he died. He was wrong about that, but we all learned from the way that he approached the literature and analyzed it and shared that with us. Um, so uh, adjuvant therapy for breast and colon cancer were just coming online as I was in my training. This was also part of my training. This is how we determine resectability for pancreas cancer when I was a resident, right? Um, we were taught that you reached behind the head of the pancreas and felt for the relationship of the tumor to the critical blood vessels. A very inexact way of uh, determining resectability. But this is what we had, uh, especially when CT, before CT imaging and even when CT imaging came in and it was still pretty bad. It was still pretty, the images were still pretty grainy and we didn't have the experience necessarily to interpret. I learned a huge amount from Dr. Mark how to interpret CAT scans. We were looking at lung cancer patients, but I remember walking through those images and um, uh, both CAT scans and plain films and him describing the anatomy that we were looking at. And that approach certainly influenced me. Well, I took um, all of that um, and with me to MD Anderson when I went to train as a fellow. And this is just a slide to show you a few of the people who've been so important to my career as, um, as colleagues, as mentors, as sponsors, as collaborators. And I can't really, you know, um, Dr. Baltz, the, the chair, Dr. Pollock, another chair of mine, Libby Grubbs, Nick Vote, Peter Pisters, Doug Evans, Merrick Ross, Jeff Gershenwald, George Chang, Tom Aloya, Jason Fleming, Matt Katz, Jen Wargo, and um, uh, Nancy Perrier. So I could talk, you know, I could give you a whole talk on each one of these people and how important they've been to me. And there are others that I can't mention. Um, I have to apologize if I've left anybody off, but um, these are the Stanford trainees who've been through our fellowship program. And I just wanted to um, encourage those of you, I know it's still early in your careers and right now you're in the middle of deciding where you want to do your surgery residency, but cancer surgery is the best specialty, I got to tell you. <laughs> and that's what I tell all the, you know, congratulations on choosing it. So. Um, but uh, Rick and Medigate and Jordan and Jeff, just uh, tremendous people and, um, and great surgeons and uh, investigators. This is our uh, fellows banquet, the finishing fellows banquet. I have to tell you, I have to reveal that we, we photoshopped Jeff Krampitz into this picture <laughs> because he was, he was off giving a lecture um, somewhere and he couldn't be there. So he was there in spirit, but just uh, a, great, you know, great, a great group. You guys should all be proud. Um, this is our fellowship program. This is my opportunity uh, to tell you what we try to value add to what you learn in surgical residency, exposure to a pure population of patients with very complex cancer problems, an apprenticeship and mentorship experience with very experienced faculty, uh, graduated independence, didactic specialty curriculum focused on oncology, a substantial integrated research environment that most of our fellows take uh, tremendous uh, um, uh, benefit from access to structured subspecialty opportunities in things like HPB, colorectal, HIPEC, sarcoma, melanoma, endocrine, etc. So, uh, to those who want those value add programs in um, all types of research and opportunities for additional professional development, leadership training, QI, and advanced degrees.
that we think are really valuable in setting you up for success in the rest of your career. We've worked hard, myself, Jason, Libby, on making this program, we think, the best in, in the country. So with that background, um, the fellows, my collaborators, and I um, focused on a few things during my career, but I'm going to highlight just a couple. One is the importance of, uh, of, of uh, a critical evaluation of diagnostic imaging before you go to the operating room for patients with cancer. And this is the example of pancreas cancer. Of course, we helped to define, there were others who were working on this at the time as well. As imaging got better, as our radiology colleagues got more skilled at interpreting what they were seeing and, and sharing that with us, we also learned how to interpret imaging in a critical way to help us know before we went to the operating room whether that tumor was coming out. And that, that's been a tremendously, uh, really a game-changing benefit for us. Most of the patients we operated on when Doug and I came on faculty were patients who other people had tried to, had had a crack at. They had tried to remove their pancreas tumors and had been unsuccessful. And with this imaging, we determined, no, in fact, their tumors were removable. We gave them pre-op therapy and then we went back and operated on them. So really important. We also developed, uh, along with others, the concept of um, resectable, borderline resectable, and um, unresectable or locally advanced. It goes along with the radiographic information. But the borderline resectable category also includes patients who may have, but don't definitely have metastatic disease, and patients who are poor candidates for initial surgery because their, their performance status or comorbidities are such that you don't want to operate on them right away. But you think you might be able to improve those during the period of pre-op therapy. Fully half of the patients with pancreas cancer that we see at Anderson are in that borderline group. It's a lot of patients that we see with this disease, partly because we're a referral center. Um, because of those patients with borderline disease or other people that operated on them, but also because we were committed to treating pancreas cancer as a biologic disease that was metastatic in most patients from the beginning, when you saw the patient, even if it looked like you could remove it on the CAT scan, we had an early commitment that has continued to pre-op therapy for pancreas cancer. Very controversial when we started this program. It's become more standard of care now, but it has taken the better part of three decades for that to happen. It's, and it's still, you know, still going on. So uh, these are the components. We give chemotherapy to all patients. We give radiation therapy now selectively to patients based on certain factors. And we use time to understand the patient's biology and also to prehab them to get them physiologically ready for a big operation. Uh, this is um, uh, a schematic of some of the clinical trials that we've done for patients with pancreas cancer over the 25 plus years that I've been on faculty. And, um, we're making very slow, very slow progress. A little bit more nowadays with more effective chemotherapy, systemic therapy agents, modestly effective, like fulfurinox and so forth. Uh, but we are making progress. Jordan Cloyd, when he was a fellow, worked with me on this project. I'm going to share it with you because it fits into the theme. He did a retrospective review of our 25-year experience giving pre-op therapy for patients with pancreas cancer at Anderson well over 600 patients. We looked at these patients in four quartiles uh, based on the time during which they were treated. And what you um, see is that over time, uh, our referral practice has shifted towards a larger proportion of patients with uh, borderline resectable or locally advanced disease, uh, the patients that we're operating on. Um, the chemotherapy has changed over time, as I told you. In the modern era, we've shifted to Fulfirinox, a more effective regimen for most of our patients. Um, we used gemcitabine in the earlier era and no chemo at all, really, just primarily radiation in the earliest era. We've also changed how we've delivered radiation therapy from an idiosyncratic short course to a more standard 50.4 gray over five and a half weeks uh, to be in better alignment, really, honestly, with what was done nationally and because we didn't see that it made that much of a difference. The operative factors have changed, but I'm going to tell you and I want to emphasize, this is not one person. This is not me. This is not Doug Evans. This is a team. The only constant over the time is, is, is me. I'm the only person who's been there the whole time. But I'm not the one who's done the majority of these cases. I've done, I've done a substantial you know, fraction, but not the majority. What we've, what we've been able to do is reduce blood loss. Uh, lymph node um, identification has gone up primarily because of templated uh, pathology reports, we think. We do the operation the same way. The proportion of patients requiring vascular resection has gone up. 
which you would predict based on the fact that more locally advanced R1 margin rates have actually gone down and remain very low, so we're able to achieve R0 margins in the majority of patients, heavily pretreated group of patients. Um, the 90-day mortality has remained low. It's actually zero in the, in the most recent era and well below the national average. We can do these things safely and we do them as a team. We all have equivalent, you can tell by the zero, we all have equivalent outcomes. Um, local regional recurrence has remained low for such an aggressive cancer and is not has not changed over time. Again, a heavily pretreated patient population. But what has changed, the patients have done better in terms of survival every quartile since we started this approach at Anderson. Um, another way of looking at it is this. So the median survival has gone from two years to three and a half, almost four years, right? And we're, we were the first ones to report this. Other groups have now reported it, similar results. A lot of this is patient selection, uh, kill as few patients as possible, and a lot of this is more effective systemic therapies in the modern era, right? Um, imaging, prehab, all those things contribute, um, but a lot of it is more effective systemic therapy, and I think that's why we will continue to make modest progress. We need to do, you know, pursue work like Rose's, Rose Wong's work in the lab to get better treatments, but we are making a little bit of progress. So one of the other um, things that I focused on was taking uh, out pancreas cancer um, and other pancreatic tumors when, uh, when other surgeons didn't think that was possible. And uh, I could only do this work with Doug Evans uh, because he was such a great uh, leader and mentor of the group, but also because I brought with me the training at Stanford. Uh, I was comfortable doing vascular surgery. Um, and that's just an example of, uh, of how these things sometimes play out outside of your exact specialty area. We do all the venous resections or constructions at Anderson, the, the pancreas surgeons do. This is an example of a long segment. Uh, there, are, there are a number of ways to do this. Uh, I don't say this is the only way, but a long segment uh, venous resection reconstruction with an autologous IJ graft in a patient who had pancreas cancer, an example of what that looks like after we're done. Uh, they're not all this long. This is unusually long, but uh, just gives you a sense. We occasionally do arterial uh, resections, reconstructions. These are situations where nowadays we do often uh, use our vascular surgery colleagues or our plastic surgery colleagues to help us for if the, if the artery is really small because they're good at that microvascular stuff. And how we, um, how we use this... Um, these techniques to extend our ability to care for patients with difficult tumor problems is illustrated by this patient who I sometimes show. This is something we've been working on a little more recently. A 13-year-old girl with just, I think you can appreciate, a huge tumor in the right upper abdomen. This is a solid pseudopapillary tumor in the pancreas. I think you can also appreciate the, um, the cavernous transformation of the portal vein underneath the liver um, and how uh, difficult that might be to approach. Um, Directly, uh, directly surgically, and how you might get into problems with bleeding. Well, the approach we've taken um, in patients, uh, in this patient, and other patients similar to this, is to again go back to vascular surgery that I learned when I was a resident here at Stanford. We used a combination of a spleno, a splenorenal shunt, permanent splenorenal shunt, to decompress the left side in this patient, and a temporary intraoperative mesocable shunt to decompress um, the central um, mesenteric venous system during the operation and then uh, took that shunt down after the tumor was out. These are pictures of a spleenorenal shunt that we used. It's identical to what you would do for vascular surgery, but in this case applied to a cancer patient population to decompress the left side. And this is a cartoon of the steps in a, a mesocable shunt. And this, these are some um, photos of, the, of that patient that I showed you um, the temporary mesocable shunt decompressing the varices so the operation was safe. The operation was done without the need for blood transfusion. And then after we close, we swing the IJ graft up to the portal vein and it provides our permanent conduit. So uh, um, you don't need to do this very often, but when you do, it's really helpful to have it as an option. So the evolution of treatment of pancreas cancer at Anderson, we use pre-op therapy, we use systemic therapy particularly before and sometimes after. We use selective radiation therapy. It's not just, I told you, the surgeon, but the team. We use prehab ERAS and survivorship that are more important as the patients do better, right? We need to make sure that their quality of life continues to be good, and these are big operations with implications for uh, quality of life. 
Uh, we use advanced surgical techniques. I haven't talked about laparoscopic or robotic. We do that too. Um, uh, I, 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 I can't talk about it for, you know, time constraints and, and other things. And it's critical to understand tumor biology and resistance. And uh, the, some of the work that I've already shown you, I think, will allow us to make much more progress. We also use these techniques of pre-op therapy and vascular surgery in other patients. I have to show a mandatory endocrine um, uh, tumor uh, because of electron here. It's a patient with adrenal cancer, and uh, we wrote up a, sh a small series of patients who had received pre-op therapy for advanced, uh, board we call the borderline resectable adrenal cancer. And this is a successful story of a patient who presented with stage four disease, uh, liver metastases, oligometastatic liver disease, and a big vena cable tumor thrombus who we treated with pre-op standard chemotherapy for adrenal cancer. She had a nice uh, partial response. We operated on her and anecdotal, uh, but it's now seven years after the surgery and she remains NED. This is a patient with stage four adrenal cancer and, um, and uh, Electron can tell you how rare that is. And the, the overall data for the, for the little study uh, showed similar results. We also really believe in neoadjuvant treatment because it's a tremendous way to understand the biology of the cancer, right? You have an ability to see what the, how the cancer responds to the treatment that you're delivering, and you have an ability to interrogate that tumor for biologic correlates before and after you remove it. And this is an example from um, the trial that Rhoda Mari and Jim Wargo did of pre-op uh, dual targeted therapy in patients with advanced melanoma who had that treatment for eight weeks and then surgery and had interrogation of their tumors. And you can see just how much was uh, learned in terms of biology. If you look at the paper, I'll just tell you in terms of the biology of response and resistance from structuring the trial in that way. We couldn't do this, just a couple things to finish with. We couldn't do this at Anderson. I know that you can't do these sorts of things at Stanford and make progress without an infrastructure to support you as individual surgeons. And we've worked really hard to develop that infrastructure to allow us to do what we call continuous quality improvement, of course. Uh, we have committees that help us to gather data on the outcomes of the patients that we're taking care of and to feed that data back to our individual specialty groups so they can take action on the data and improve outcomes, something that has become much more common and standard these days, certainly wasn't when I started my fellowship when I went through my surgery training here uh, or even when I started as a faculty member. Uh, as a result, we can, sh we can point to our NISQIP data, to our ACS NISQIP data, and we look pretty good. You know, we didn't necessarily look good when we started doing this data across the board. For example, urinary tract infection was a problem and we had to improve on that. We closed those gaps and, and, and we, we get this kind of data now. It's also important to look at patient satisfaction data. Everybody is, but we believe in it too, and we look at that and we feed it back to the faculty and the teams who are taking care of the patients to look for opportunities for improvement. Um, when we have a group that's focused on innovation as much as our group is, it's really important, we think, that you have a structure that allows for safe innovation. I mean that safe from the patient standpoint, safe from the regulatory standpoint, but doesn't provide uh, too many unnecessary administrative roadblocks in surgeons getting treatments to patients as quickly, new treatments to patients as quickly as possible. So we have this structure. Uh, Tom Aloya just published a paper in Annals of Surgery on exactly this topic. So I would encourage you, if you're interested, to look at that. Finally, um, when I was a trainee here, uh, there were a couple of experiences that um, honestly were probably uh, influenced me more than I realized at the time, and it's good in the senior part of my career that I can get back to them at least in some indirect ways. When I was a first year medical student, I went out to the Central Valley in California. I worked at a public health service um, clinic uh, taking care of underserved patients. Um, there, were, there was a large population of Hispanic patients. There were also Vietnamese refugees. Um, and the photos on the right are pictures of us, me and the Vietnamese refugees going to uh, the uh, irrigation ditches in the rice fields and pulling crayfish out um, to add to the 100 pound bags of rice that they were uh, using to feed their families. Um, when I was a um, resident at Stanford, uh, I was one of the last residents, I think, to go to uh, Hawaii uh, for six months and work with Cliff Straley. 
and others uh, doing primarily cardiac, uh, non-cardiac thoracic and vascular surgery. Uh, Dr. Mark remembers that program very well. Um, it was a tremendous experience. Part of that experience was taking care of a large population of patients at Kaiser Moana Loa for Native Hawaiians. And this is a picture of us um, fishing, uh, doing subsistence fishing with a net um, in uh, the waters off of uh, beautiful Cove in Kauai. So um, I'm, I, I really have always kept with me from Stan, my training at Stanford, treating uh, patients at places like Valley Medical Center and others, the desire to provide outstanding cancer care to, um, uh, to um, some patients who can't come to MD Anderson for insurance reasons or geography or, or other reasons. And uh, we're beginning to do that in ways that I've been involved in for about the past decade. I'm really proud of our, um, uh, some of the programs that we built collaboratively with UTMB at Galveston, the Safety Net Hospital with LBJ, another Safety Net Hospital with San Antonio and UT Tyler, who have large populations of, uh, of, of these patients, um, and um, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully more to come. We also work nationally to try to improve cancer care across the country. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that we have major partnerships in San Diego to the south of us, uh, at Banner in Phoenix, um, at Baptist in Florida, in Jacksonville, Florida, and at, at uh, Cooper in uh, Camden, New Jersey. And, I've been very involved in these programs. I, I am uh, going to be more involved with them. I was sharing with Electron yesterday, um, more involved with them in the future. And I'm really happy about the ability to give back to a larger patient population, some of the lessons that I've learned. I'm gonna leave you with this uh, from Houston. Apollo 11 landed on the moon uh, 50 years ago. Um, and that was a program that Houston played a big part in. Houston was a very different place when the space program was launched. Uh, less than a million people, but we built the Astrodome and International Airport that some of you have flown in and out of. We were perceived as losing the space race, and of course, in 1962, President Kennedy came to Rice University, to Rice Stadium, and he said those famous words all of us know that we choose to go to the moon in this decade, right? He also said, we meet at a college, Rice, noted for knowledge, and a city noted for progress, and a state noted for strength. Now, he was playing to Lyndon Johnson, who was his vice president at the time, right? He was from Texas. But we're, you know, we, we like the fact that he, um, we're, we're kind of from Texas now, and he announced uh, this new space center, um, and he announced uh, a new rocket system. And uh, over the next uh, couple of years, in 1963, just the next year, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center was opened. If you get a chance to come to Houston, it's just been renovated. It looks exactly like it did um, in, um, uh, it looks exactly like it did in 1969 uh, during Apollo 11 era. Um, and the Saturn V was built, and uh, this is particularly was kind of interesting to me. Multiple contractors had to come together, so this is like what we're doing with, uh, from my experience, resonates with what we're doing with UTMB and UT San Antonio and across the country with these different healthcare systems. This was the only launch vehicle to transport humans below Earth, low Earth orbit, the tallest and heaviest, most powerful rocket at the time, but there were no failed launches. So. They had, at least when they got off the launch pad, they had a perfect safety record with the Saturn V. And so the lessons I take away that I'll leave you with, you can't get to the moon without doing a lot of heavy lifting, that's a metaphor. All of you who are starting your surgery residencies, right, John Collins said, it's gonna be hard, but the, the process of becoming a surgeon is challenging, but being a surgeon is great. And I would say that's been my experience over the course of my career. I'm sure other people in the audience can can say that too. A bull vision can be a powerful thing. It helps to have competition. We had competition with the Soviet Union. There was competition in the Saturn V team. Uh, effective collaboration can allow for bigger achievements. When human lives are at stake, a commitment to safety and reliability is absolutely critical. And then finally, this is me. Um, sometimes a path to success involves a trip to a mosquito-invested swamp on the Gulf Coast. Thanks, everybody.